स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया Today we will start talking about fixed points of group actions. Okay, so let's make the definitions first. Now uh, we start with a group G acting on a set X. So let's say G is a group, and because this was our shorthand for saying that G, there is an action of G on the set X. So it's a set X group G, and sometimes we say. as a shorthand that x is a g set in other words it's a set with a group action the action of the group g okay so given this given a group and a set on which it acts uh, a fixed point so a point a point or a or an element an element x of x is said to be a fixed point is said to be a fixed point or a g fixed point said to be a g fixed point if the following happens that g acting on x gives me x for all group elements g and g in other words it's fixed the element x is fixed by the action of every group element now we have a, a another way of saying this equivalently uh, another equivalent formulation is to say that the orbit of the element x is just the singleton x okay remember the orbit just comprises all the elements of the form gx as g varies over g but here you only get the element x in the orbit so another way of saying that a, a point is fixed is to say that its orbit is a singleton okay and uh, here's the notation for the set of all fixed points x superscript g is the set of all fixed points it's set of all x and x such that uh, gx is x for all g and g so this is the set of fixed points okay now uh, here's uh, another little definition so this is uh, regarding the group itself so we say that suppose p is a prime number uh, if the cardinality of the group is a power of p if this looks like p power k for some k greater than equal to 1 then we say g is a p group so this again is a is a situation which will arise frequently enough to warrant its own uh, terminology so shorthand we say that a group g is a p group if it is a finite group whose cardinality is some power of a prime p okay so the p is the same p here okay now uh, so what what do i mean the definitions of fixed points and p groups have sort of been given one after the other for the following reason we have the following uh proposition which concerns the actions of p groups on sets and what their fixed points look like and so on so if g is a p group so let g be a p group so i have fixed the prime p here and let x be a g set it's got an action of the group g such that the cardinality of x is not a multiple of p okay so notice that g and x are of very different types g is uh, has cardinality a power of p and x has cardinality which is not even divisible by p okay they are sort of the uh, opposite ends of the spectrum in some sense but if you do have such a situation and you have the group g acting on the set x then something very interesting happens then this action must necessarily have a fixed point in other words a set of fixed points cannot be empty i e there exists a fixed point or a g fixed point 
Okay, so it's a theorem which uh, asserts the existence of fixed points. Okay, so let's uh, prove this proposition. So what is it that we need to prove? We need to prove that there exists a singleton orbit, right? So remember that's what fixed points are. So I need to show to prove that at least one orbit has cardinality one. There exists an orbit g orbit. Um, let's call it O such that the cardinality of that orbit is one. Okay, uh, there is an orbit of some element a. I mean, the orbits remember partition the set X into a, a disjoint uh, union. I mean, the disjoint union of orbits is just the whole set X. Now, uh, let us try and find this orbit or prove that such an orbit must necessarily exist. So, uh, let us take a typical element of X and ask what can its orbit look like or what cardinality can its orbit have. So, let A in X, now let us look at the orbit of A and observe the cardinality of this orbit is given by the, the counting formula recall which says that this is the cardinality of the full group divided by the cardinality of the stabilizer of that element. Okay, G sub A is just a stabilizer. So, G sub A is nothing but the set of all elements of the group so that G acting on A gives me back A. So, that is the stabilizer. Okay. Now, what is G A here? G A recall is a subgroup of G. So, by Lagrange's theorem, the cardinality of this subgroup must divide the cardinality of the group. But remember, I have assumed G is a P group. In other words, the cardinality of G is some power of P. This means the cardinality of G A is therefore also a power of P. This must look like some P power I. Okay. These are the only divisors of p power k. So, this, this exponent i is some number between 0 and, and k. Now, observe what does this tell us? This says that the orbit cardinality is also a power of p. This is just p to the k minus i. Okay. So, this is some power of p. Of course, k could equal i. So, this power could just be p power 0 which is 1, okay. but it could be any of the other powers 1, p, p square, etcetera. So, now uh, what does that mean? So, this is therefore, what is it? This is either 1 or some higher power of p uh, or well any power of p, p, p square, p cubed and so on are all divisible by p. So, or divisible by p. So, there are only two possibilities. It is either the orbit, orbit cardinality can either be 1 if it is p power 0 or if it is p, p square, p cubed, then those numbers are all necessarily divisible by p. Okay. And now observe that the cardinality of the whole set x is just the sum of the cardinalities of the different orbits. So, let me give the orbit some name uh, O, j is let us say j uh, you know running over how many ever disjoint orbits I have. So, what are the O, j s? O, j s are the distinct orbits uh, g orbits in x. Okay. Now, this equation here on the left hand side, I have a number which is not divisible by p that was my hypothesis that p does not divide the cardinality of x. Whereas, on the right hand side, I have a sum of numbers each of which is either 1 or divisible by p. Okay. So, what does that mean? This equality can only appear, I mean the fact that this equality holds means that the right hand side must have some 1s. Right? Otherwise, all the, the summons on the right hand side are necessarily multiples of p, which would also imply that the left hand side must be a multiple of p. Okay. So, by what we have just said, so this property star here that orbit cardinalities are, are either 1 or a multiple of p, we conclude so by star and the fact that the left hand side, which is cardinality x, is not divisible by p, we conclude there must be at least one orbit oj such that its cardinality is not divisible by p, but that means uh, the cardinality is 1. Okay, I mean that is by star in some sense. So, star is really being used here um, to say that the cardinality is 1, okay, which means there exists a fixed point, which is exactly what we are talking about. 
So that completes the proof. Okay, so that's the end of proof here. We have shown at least one orbit is a singleton. Okay, but in fact, we have shown a little bit more. So if you have, if you sort of look at, you know, what the proof shows. So the proof establishes a little stronger result. So let's call this uh, proposition. Uh, well, uh, let's call it proposition for now. So this is a slight strengthening of the earlier one. So under the same hypothesis, under so let's write the hypothesis again. Uh, G finite group acting on a finite set X. G is a P group. X doesn't have is not divisible by P, the cardinality. Uh, then we have sh just shown that there definitely exists uh, some fixed points. But in fact, what we have shown is that if you look at how many fixed points there are, the number of fixed points the cardinality of xg and the cardinality of x are actually congruent to each other modulo p. Okay? So recall what congruence means, we say two numbers are congruent to each other. So recall uh, when do you say two numbers are congruent to each other, m and n, you say m is congruent to n mod p, if m minus n, I mean they both leave the same remainder when divided by p. In other words, we say m is congruent to n if p divides their difference. Right. So, here again I am saying that the, the, the cardinality of the subset xg is congruent to the, the cardinality of the whole set x modulo p and proof well uh, the same, same observation as before that on the one hand I have the cardinality of x, on the other hand I have the cardinalities of the, the different uh, orbits. Now some of these, so I, I will um, rewrite this sum as the sum over the singleton orbits. So, I can say let us first take uh, the cardinalities of only those OJs which are singleton orbits, only those Js which are the fixed points plus the cardinality of those orbits which are non singletons, sum over J such that the cardinality of OJ is greater than 1. Okay? Now, observe that uh, what is this when you sum over the orbits whose cardinality is, is exactly 1, what you are doing is just summing over the, the fixed points. So, here this sum will just give you x g and now the sum over the orbit cardinalities which are greater than 1, these remember are all some proper higher powers of p. So, this sum is going to be divisible by p. Okay. In other words, we have shown exactly what we need to show in this proposition that cardinality of x minus the cardinality of x g is divisible by p. So, p divides the cardinality of x minus x g. That is what congruence modulo p means. Okay. So, that is the end of the proof. Okay. Now, uh, this very simple proposition has in fact numerous applications. Uh, it it is in some sense one of the very important results in in um, in this topic. So, uh, let me start by uh, you know as a warm up let us do one simple application and our eventual goal is to is to apply this to prove the, the various silo theorems. Okay. So, here are some applications of the earlier propositions rather the, the strengthened proposition that I stated second. So, here is an application. So, uh, this is called from number theory, this is called Fermat's little theorem. So, for those of you who have seen this before, uh, what is the theorem state? Well, it says that a power p is congruent to a modulo p. So, this is a statement of the theorem for all what is a, a is a natural number and p is of course some prime p. So, I am fixing some prime p, p is some prime number. Fermat's little theorem says that if I take a number a, a natural number a and I raise it to the pth power, that gives me the same, uh, it is congruent modulo p to the original number itself. Okay? And of course, this can be proved very simply just by, for example, it is an instance of Lagrange's theorem if you wish. But uh, let us just see how to prove this using this fixed point principle that we just talked about. So, observe this is sort of already more or less in the form of the fixed point principle. Okay? 
So what I will try to do is the following. I will try to put this into the framework of the fixed point principle as follows. So what do I need in order to apply my fixed point principle? I need a P group. I need a, a, a set X. Okay. So this is the second principle, the, the one which says that cardinality of uh, X and XG are, uh, are the same. Um, probably said something not so precise in the in the second principle. So I uh, I don't really need this assumption on p not dividing x. That is only to that was only required in the first part of the proposition. So uh, because there I was trying to conclude that x g is not empty. In the the second one is more general. So so uh, you know, one should erase that from the hypothesis. So let me restate the second proposition again. This says that if a group finite group acts on a finite set and if the group G is a P group, then it is true that the set of fixed points is congruent to the original group model of P. Okay. So, I do not really need uh, to assume that uh, P does not divide the cardinality of X. So, I could have 0 fixed points in this case. Okay. So, now let me go back to this. So, what am I trying to do? I am trying to construct a P group G which will act on a finite set X and uh, in order for this conclusion to result, let me try and find. So, we will try to do this, try to find a finite set X whose cardinality is A power P. So, that is the left hand side uh, here and whose fixed point set has cardinality A. Okay. So, that is the plan, trying to find something whose fixed point set is A and the original set is A power P. Okay? And the group must be a P group which acts on it. So, let us try and do this. So, what is this number A here? A is just some natural number. So, how do we find a set whose cardinality is A power P? Well, the simplest thing to do is let us just take first a set of cardinality A. So, the simplest set is 1, 2, 3 till A. So, observe y has cardinality a and how do I construct something of cardinality a power p? I will just take many copies of this. So, let us take y cross y cross y. I mean by copies, I mean the cross product. This is just the Cartesian product y power p uh, and observe this has the correct cardinality now. Cardinality of x is exactly a power p. Now, what are elements of x? If you think about it, it is just all elements of the following form. It is y1 comma y2 comma y p all p tuples where each y i is a number between 1 and a right each y i is an element of y. So, that is what my, my set x looks like all p tuples of numbers between 1 and a. So, I have a set with a correct cardinality. Now, I must try and uh, concoct a group g which is a p group which acts on this set. Now, the easiest p group in some sense is just a cyclic group of cardinality p. So, let us do that next. So, for my group, I will choose just a cyclic group C p okay, of cardinality p. So, let me write its elements as follows. One is the identity element of this group sigma sigma square sigma power p minus 1, okay, where sigma is the generator of the cyclic group. So, sigma power p is 1. So, here is a this is definitely a p group it has cardinality exactly p here and I need to make this cyclic group act on this set x which if you recall from the uh, previous page is just all p tuples of elements y1, y2, yp. So, how do we make a cyclic group act on p tuples? That is the question. Now. So, we need to define an action. So, let us define this as follows. So, let us try to figure out how this, this generator sigma of the cyclic group will have to act sigma when it acts on this p tuple of elements. So, I am going to take a typical element y1, y2. So, let me take uh, y1, y2, yp. This is an element of x. I need to make this uh, into another element of x. There is sort of one obvious thing I can do. Uh, let it act by cyclic permutation or cyclic uh, permutation of the entries of y. So, in other words, I will push everything one step to the right. So, uh, I 
move y1 to the second position, y2 to the third position and so on. In the end I put yp minus 1 and yp gets cyclically rotated and sort of moves up to the first of this uh, tuple. Okay, so this is how I define the action of sigma. It takes the tuple y1, y2, yp and cyclically rotates the entries. Of course, sigma square therefore will perform a cyclic rotation by two steps. So, I will have to define it in the, the obvious fashion. I will move yp minus 1 and yp to the first, move y1 two steps to the right and so on. Okay, the higher powers of sigma will all have to act likewise and it is an easy exercise to check that this in fact defines an action. This is an action. In other words, you have to check the axioms of an action. The identity uh, acts trivially, so you also define the identity action as just doing nothing, y1, y2, yp just gives you back y1, y2, yp. Okay. And it is very easy to check that this satisfies the, the definitions of the axiom, uh, definitions of an action. The key point is somehow if you do sigma p times, you get back to the identity. That is really all the checking uh, involves. Okay. So, uh, I will leave this for you to check. But having done this, let us see if this, this gives us what we want. So, we have managed to define an action of a p group on a set x. And like I said, I do not need any assumption on p dividing the cardinality of x or not dividing the cardinality of x on this guy, uh, in this case. So, in this, in this setting, I know the following that the cardinality of x and the cardinality of its fixed points are congruent to each other modulo p. Okay. Now, the left hand side as we know is a power p in this case because that is that is how we chose the set. So, let us look to see what the right hand side looks like which is the cardinality I mean I need to look at the fixed point set first. So, what, what are the fixed points for this action? So, that is a question. right? So, uh, suppose I have a certain p tuple y1, y2, yp in xg and this p tuple is fixed under the action. So, I, I take y1, y2, yp in xg, what does it mean? Uh, this means that in particular it is fixed by sigma, right? every element of, of the group fixes it, in particular sigma fixes it, the generator. But observe the left hand side is just a cyclic permutation of the entry. So, this is yp, y1, y2, yp minus 1. Now, how can these two possibly be equal? So, the fact that these are equal, it is only possible if all the entries are equal, right? Because you just look at the, the, the second entries of, of, of these two tuples, you observe in this case it is y1 and in the other case it is y2. Okay? So, y1 must be the same as y2. Now, compare the third entries y2 and y3 and so on. So, unless all the entries are equal to each other, you cannot get the cyclic rotation being equal to the original. Okay? Now, uh, what does that mean? It means that the only possible fixed points have the following form. So, what does xg look like? Well, xg looks like this. Uh, it is y, 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 y. All, all numbers y are the same. But what are the possible values of y? y can be any number from 1 to a. Okay. This in particular means that you know it is all 1s or all 2s or all 3s and so on till all a's and this means that this is exactly a. There are just a fixed points. Okay. So, what does that mean? It means we have proved Fermat's little theorem as a corollary of our um, fixed point principle, the more general fixed point principle. Okay. So, in the next video, we will look at a slightly more complicated application of this, which will also turn out to appear in our proof of the silo theorems.